All righty, folks, let me acknowledge that I'm getting older, and that, <laughs> and that uh, so are you. All right, let me help you with that acknowledgement. The only difference is who has started sooner, who has started later, but we're all aging at the same rate one day at a time. All right, but we have these mile markers, we call them birthdays, and our, our birth year and whatnot, and already I'm, you know, I can't help it. You know, I was born in 1959. So in May, when my birthday comes, I will be? Right. And that's, that's, that's got like a nice round number. <laughs> like a lot of curves to it. <laughs> and I'm thankful, amen, to, to be at this stage in my life. Um, you know, I can remember when that was an old timer. A severely old person. <laughs> I would have been in my 20s, maybe in my teens. At that point, a 30-year-old was old to me. Okay? You guys, I, I, I came uh, I, uh, to know the Lord in a very personal way. And I marked my coming around age 16 to the Lord. And uh, I was in a smaller church. Some of you are familiar with it. And uh, uh, got the opportunity to do uh, uh, some things very early on, okay? Because it's an, an independent church. They just kind of, you know, in-house everything. Um, I'm not sure, but that by, I don't know if I was 17 or 18, and I had just come to the Lord at 16, I was up behind the pulpit. Okay, right, amen. Now, part of it was just I didn't know any better. <laughs> no business maybe being up there. <laughs> I did have a heart always to want to help. And figured that others who were more experienced were saying, yeah, you. If you think so, okay, here I go. All righty. So a very young age, and I didn't have religious training growing up. I had heard, you know, in the amount of time that I've been there, and I had heard something about some guy named Job. <laughs> Job, really, you know. <laughs> Looked like Job to me. <laughs> And, and I thought I knew the story pretty good. You know, that some man had a lot, some bad stuff happened, he lost it all, but God was so good, and he got it all back. That was my first sermon. I was smart enough to know that if I'm going to preach on this, and I, I had heard the story, that I, um, that I probably should read the book. You know, that made sense to me. I was sincere. Um, so I told myself, and I worked at a daycare center, and they used to have a nap time. I thought, oh, during na nap time, I'll, I'll read the book. And, and then I realized the book had 42 chapters. Folks, a part of the story that I was familiar with Happens in the first two chapters and the very last one. That's three chapters. But there's 42 chapters in the book. I want you to know that I'm going to uh, start off, probably I think where I started off, is one of the few sermons that I didn't write down notes and save I, I can go pretty far back in my life. I've got them all at home. Same size sheet, handwritten, just like this. <laughs> Maybe my wife can make a book after I'm gone. Um, Job 26, 14. And, I, and uh, I want you to look at your, you probably have a, a modern, more modern translation, but I'm going to ask uh, Caitlin, to put it in how I learned it back in the day. Lo, and then the, Dr. 
Mr. Lolo. <laughs> Listen up, Pete. <laughs> Lopez. <laughs> Job 26, 14. Lo, these are parts of his ways. But how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? You guys, 38 chapters of the book of Job are devoted to a dialogue among various people, mostly Job and his famous three friends. But there's also dialogue uh, uh, in the heavens. There's dialogue between Job and his wife. There's dialogue between uh, 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 a young man, a fourth friend, who shows up later on, uh, Elihu, and, and, um, and talks, though no one responds back to him. I always wonder about that. Folks, I understand the book of Job a whole lot better now than I did when I first preached. Okay? Uh, so I, I want to share because I, I've always enjoyed when someone would break down word of God in such a way that I knew they were talking from life experience. That it wasn't just, though the theology and, and the correct understanding and that kind of thing is, ve is important, very important. But I also enjoy when they're able to interject, and I, and I get a sense, oh, man, you picked that up through life, walking with God. So today I want to share with you a little bit uh, from that perspective that I did not have, plus I did not have the understanding back then that I do now. But this much I'm going to acknowledge right up front, and that is my modern translation, which you know, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? King James language, very poetic, very beautiful. Uh, you understand what that's saying? Kind of, right? It's, this translation says, these are but the outer fringe of his workings. How faint the whisper we hear of him. So who then can understand the thunder of his power? Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, very well known. My thoughts are not your thoughts, uh, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Folks, how many of you, if I stand up here and I go like this, whew, would understand what I'm saying? That if, uh, if Justin were talking to me about chemistry, and, and I've get, I'm getting kind of a glazed look in my eyes, but he keeps talking, and then I turn to the rest of you and I go, <laughs> how many of you understand? That's got nothing to do with my hairstyle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? I'm saying, man, that stuff that guy's talking is beyond me. It's over my head. Isaiah is saying that, that the Lord says, hey, understand something. My ways, not your ways. My thoughts, not your thoughts. As the heavens are higher, so are my ways and my thoughts than your ways and your thoughts. That causes me to want to uh, look upward. That causes me and challenges me to... Uh, um, Try, but folks, let me share something to you from experience. Lo, these are but part of his ways. But how little a portion is actually heard of him. The thunder of his power, who can understand? And the answer is, the answer is nobody. Not the thunder of his power. What he is displaying is just a small portion of it. And we can't quite grasp that, so why would we think that we would grasp it all? If he were perchance to try to give it all to us. 
You guys, I, I want to speak to you on this topic, understanding the misunderstanding. Understanding the misunderstanding. Man, I could go in a lot of tangents with this. We could talk marriage. We could talk um, family life. We can talk parenting. We can talk uh, uh, co-workers, uh, employment places, uh, everywhere where there's more than one person. This would have some. But you guys, I want to talk to us about what the book of Job is talking about. And that is regarding our walk with God. Our walk with God. The appeal of Job, and the Job, you guys, is, uh, I took a literature class in college, because I had to, and um, I remember the book of Job was on that syllabus. It was on, it was on the, you know, what, one of the works that we were going to study. Along with, the, I forget the other ones, but I reckon, you know, like an Aristotle work and a Socrates. And, and, and there was Job. And I remember the college professor, you know, giving the introduction and saying what a great work of literature it was. And acknowledging the universal appeal of Job which in our modern translation goes something like this, why do, or, or, or modern language, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? You guys, all through history, that has been, uh, maybe not phrased exactly like that, but that is the crux of what people uh, struggle with in, of all times and in all societies. As life goes and and. You know, the human dilemma is this, that we want to understand everything. We do. We are wired that way. God has made us that way with this quest. It also, though, has been probably made a little worse by our sin nature because part of the motivation is that we might better control things. So uh, let me just, you know, once again, understanding the misunderstanding as it relates to God. This idea of getting a handle on God a lot of times is our way of, of uh, boxing him in. Of, of, of providing constra uh, constraints, uh, uh, and you know what, I, I, this is from my life experience. God has been so gracious to me. He's, he, he stays in my box sometimes. Especially as I align myself with what he wants. But invariably, every box that I've ever constructed, eventually he steps outside of. And I'm left doing this. Like, but I, th I thought I understood. The book of Job has this back and forth dialogue. And um, I, I want to show you uh, in his time frame, into his time period which may precede the life of Abraham. In other words, the book of Job d doesn't have anything that fully indicates when this is happening. Okay? But the, the, the fact that there is no mention of the law, in the Mosaic law, you know, in this great discussion about God, it was their framework, at least for most of the Old Testament. 
or at least the, 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 the covenant of God with Abraham, Father Abraham and the patriarchs. There's no mention of any of that. So that causes us, uh, uh, most people to say then Job must have occurred before the stories of Abraham and therefore the story of Moses. So it is far back in history. This is the understanding that they had. Uh, that good man, good God thing. Okay. All right, listen to this statement because these are the components. Because of a good God, a good man living a good life will have good results. Right? Okay? That's the... The understanding that they have because of a good God, a good man living a good life, in other words, practicing well, will have good results, or in other words, the circumstantial outcome will be good. How many of you like that? Because of a good God, a good man, these include the ladies, I said mankind, <laughs> li uh, uh, living a good life, or practicing well, is going to have good circumstantial outcome. Folks, I like that concept. I, I, I believe that in different places of the scriptures I read it. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go through, all, let me see, Psalm 1. Let me just go there. Just the very first Psalm, uh, the first couple of verses. Uh, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. And he's like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked, they're like the, like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Folks, that's pretty straightforward, is it not? Because of a good God, uh, a good man living a good life is going to have good results. James 1 in the New Testament in verse 25, um, uh, but the man who looks into uh, the perfect law that gives freedom, which would be God's word, and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in uh, all that he does. Pretty straightforward. Uh, Galatians 6, 7 uh, puts it, in a, don't be deceived, God cannot be mocked, a man reaps what he sows. Folks, do we believe that? Yes, we do believe that. Because there is in, in, uh, in God's creation, both naturally and uh, spiritually, uh, a, a principle of sowing and reaping. That is generally at work. That we would be good to acknowledge this is the general rule. And work it, you know, pleasing to God, advantageous to us. A amen. That's why God let us know you're going you're gonna to reap what you sow. But um, experience has taught me that there are exceptions. Has life taught you that yet? Yeah? So that it's not always quite, you know, a farmer who does everything right and yet does not have a crop causes them to, it doesn't stop them from working the general principle the following year. You 
guys, it becomes inexplicable sometimes to us. The exceptions. The why didn't it pan out the way it generally does. The way I expect it to. The way that gives me a certain comfort level. Because it does give me a greater comfort level with life and, and even with God. But you guys, the problem is that God, by definition, by his word, is beyond us. He is infinite and we're finite. There is no way in the world you're going to get a total handle on God. Let me, let me put, your, put you at ease. Okay, because uh, my, I'm talking from experience now. Amen. I want to increase in my understanding and in my knowledge of God, but I am not going to increase to the point that I totally get him. And neither are you. Um, you don't know how far you can, or, or you don't know the extent of your limit without extending your reach. So that's why we keep doing it. Because he wants us to understand him more and more. His thoughts and his ways. But he never said that we we're going to get it all. That is what was happening in the dialogue between Job and his friends. The friends were maintaining there is a good God. So uh, Job, in your case, it has to be a man, um, you know, who, who is uh, receiving bad results, must, be, must not be living a good life. That was how they pieced it together, you know, this idea of the, you know, those components, good man or good God, good man, good life, good results. They were saying, yes, good God, uh, but a man not living a good life, consequently, you don't have the good results. And that explains, Job, what's going on in your life. So you better fess up. <laughs> You guys, Job is saying the one thing he knows for sure is that he is living a good life, or at least not one very different from when all his circumstances were real good. He knows that. That's what he means by, I will maintain my integrity. He is saying, I know, folks, and we do know most of the time. About ourselves. Not fully, but we have a pretty good sense. Sometimes we don't want to acknowledge it. Sometimes we don't want to face it. Sometimes we don't want to change it. <laughs> but we kind of know it. And Job knew that he wasn't doing anything overly different from what he had been doing his life. And before it resulted in these circumstantial blessings. So Job maintained that he was a good man living a good life, but he had bad results. He acknowledged that. You guys, and Job looked at God and said, maybe I need to talk to you. God, maybe it's you. Folks, and I know that the scripture says that in all this, Job sinned not. That's in, the very, that's in the second chapter. The dialogue part, he says some stuff that ain't right. I, I, I know we like to extol and we talk about the patience of Job, but really it's the patience of God that is demonstrated in the book of Job. But, but in chapter 40, when God finally shows up after he let these guys, and you know what, you guys? God will let us talk. Have you noticed that? 
He lets us think and talk and, and feel and, and uh, he's not condoning it. It's just he's willing in his graciousness and in his patience to let us do it. He shows up in chapter 40, and let me read just a couple of verses. Um, the Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Because for quite a few chapters, Job's been putting some stuff out there, and he's pointing a finger saying, not, It's not me. And my practices that have caused me these bad. God, if only I could have a conversation with you. Of course, I'd probably do good to have a lawyer when I'm having it with you because you're the Almighty. <laughs> then Job answered the Lord. Listen to what Job says. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. And, and, and God will continue to speak to Job out of the storm. For two chapters, God asked Job questions. N not, not, not about his situation, but about when did you get so smart? That's what the questions were. Job, you know so much. Then let me ask you, you know. Where, you know, where were you before, you know, uh, before the creation? How did I hang up the earth suspended uh, with nothing touching it? Folks, a series of questions that Job can't begin to answer. But he was willing to point to God and say, I think there's something wrong with you. After two chapters of that, and God says, so who is it that's, you know, wants to do all this questioning? Job is already starting to lean towards, ugh, boy. I opened my mouth once, I ain't going to open it twice. But God wasn't done. And for another two chapters, he's got some more questions about just a little portion Job, that I have shown you that you don't know everything about. Okay? To the point that in chapter 42, uh, after the second round, Job replied to the Lord. Job 42, first opening verses. I know, listen to this, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I have... Uh, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and, and you shall answer me. But my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Folks, under, under, understanding the misunderstanding. The misunderstanding of Job and his three friends is that all of them thought they were going to grasp God fully. And none of them could do that. But they didn't understand that they were just in an ongoing quest to know him better. And that is good. Folks, and that's a quest that we all ought to be on. But to get to the point where you so have a handle that you can call God out on the carpet? My friend, you've gone too far. God never explains to Job the why. He explains it to us. He explains it to us. The why of Job's story is that there was a contest in the heavens, dialogue between spiritual beings and God. Explains what was going on in Job's life. But you know what God never explained to Job? That. Because, folks, he is God Almighty and he owes us no explanation.
we extol ourselves and we can't hardly help it too highly. Job's prosperity is returned because he acknowledges, I don't get it. But I see you more clearly. And I'm going to trust you. Folks, can I remind us that that is our faith walk? And that is that we believe in him. As in, I trust you. Your ways beyond my ways, your thoughts beyond my, so there are times when we're, we go pew, pew, <laughs> pew, pew, pew. <laughs> and I say, trust you, God. Still trust in you, God. Of course, you could get into a big discussion and people have, you know, wh wh why do uh, good things happen uh, I mean, to bad people? And why do bad things happen to good people? And somebody could question, you know, something you one time thought was bad later on in your life, you thank God for it? There's some stuff like that in most of our lives if you've lived long enough. When you thought you wanted such and such and, and want this, this, and that, and then later on uh, you saw God's plan unfurl better better and you say oh god thank you amen all them country songs for unanswered prayer you know <laughs> folks understand the misunderstanding it's because of my own finiteness there's nothing wrong with god may i stay humble enough to stay submitted because i can get on a high horse And if pain's involved and whatnot, then I can become more demanding. I see it in the hospital all the time. I don't care who else is in this hospital. I want the doctor now. <laughs> but in our right mind, we say, no, it's right that there be priorities. And the person coming into the emergency room with a heart attack is, you know, uh, more in need than, than me and my, you know, my gastro, you know, though that really hurts. It does. Job humbles himself and to the point of repentance. Therefore, sees and understands God more. And um, you know what? He's done his need for an explanation. He's done his need for an explanation. I heard this quote, and I'll close with this. To those who believe, no explanation is necessary. Amen. To those who don't believe, no explanation will ever do. To those who believe, no explanation is necessary. To those who don't believe, no explanation will ever do. Dear God, I thank you for this stage in my life. I believe. Amen. I'm comfortable. When I was young, I thought I had to understand it all. I did. I was on a quest. <laughs> Amen. The older I've gotten, the more I realize, Lord, I just, I just got to keep trusting. I just got to keep trusting, Lord. I, I got to understand that misunderstanding. Your ways just ha are higher. Your ways are greater. Amen. Folks, let's stand. Thank you, God.